Straight Shift. With the Car Chick, the podcast that's all about cars, buying, selling, fixing, and driving. And sometimes pretty fast if you're the Car Chick. Now, here she is. Hey, folks, welcome to the Straight Shift. Today, we're going to be talking about some seriously shady stuff that unfortunately still happens in the automotive industry. I don't know if you've ever heard of this situation, but someone goes into a car dealership and buys a new or a new to them car. They get approved for a loan, or at least they thought they were. They sign all the paperwork. The dealer takes their current car on trade, and they drive home all happy in their shiny new car. Then the next day, or even a few days later, they get a call from the dealer saying, well, you know, the bank came back to us and said, wah, 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 something went wrong, they couldn't approve it, so you're going to have to come back in and sign some new papers and put a little more money down, and now the interest rate is this, wah, wah, wah. This is called a yo-yo transaction or a yo-yo scam, also known as a spot delivery scam. And guess what? That crap is illegal. And since I am not a lawyer, I have a fantastic guest today, Steve Moskus of the Moskus Law Firm. Steve has been protecting consumers from shady crap that happens with businesses, particularly in the automotive industry, for over 30 years. And today, Steve is going to talk to us about the legalities and illegalities of yo-yo transactions and what you can do to protect yourself so that that doesn't happen to you. Hey, Steve, how are you doing today? I'm great, Leanne. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Please explain to us what exactly is meant by a yo-yo transaction. What is the deal? What you have to understand is that the usually a car dealership, all the franchise dealerships, want to sell cars. They don't want to finance cars. They don't want to have to chase people uh, to get paid. So what they're doing is they're selling a car and most people can't pay cash for a brand new car or even a used car. And so what they, the dealership does is it extends credit. It's not giving you a loan. It's extending credit. It's kind of like layaway. Only you get the item before you finish paying for it. Then they turn around and they take the paper, the retail installment sales contract, the financing paperwork, uh, whatever you want to call it. And they take it to a, lending institution. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bank. It could be a credit union. It could be somebody like GMAC. Right. That's the captive finance company owned by the manufacturer. But generally, as consumers, we just think of them all as banks. Fair enough. So the they, the dealership goes to the bank and says, hey, we have this wonderful customer. They're good people. You know, they've they've come up with this deal. And will you buy this paper from us? And, of course, the bank looks at the person's credit and and the deal and then makes a decision as to whether to buy the paper. Uh, when they do, then you start making your payments to the bank. Uh, you get the car, the dealership gets the money, and the bank gets your payments over time. And the title to your car. And the title to your car until you've paid it off. And right. but, but here's here's the rub. Maybe you come in late in the evening. Maybe you come in on a weekend. Uh, Maybe there's something that the bank, uh, it needs before it can make a final decision. The dealership sitting there knowing that you're making a big purchase and it does not want you walking out the door and saying, hey, you know what? I, you know, in essence, cooling off and you coming back and saying, you know, I thought about this and I really don't like the deal. I can't afford it. Uh, the insurance is going to be too much. I, I can't afford the taxes, whatever it happens to be. Right. They want to close the sale right then and there because they know that it, you may never come back. That's right. So um, and it's a, and, and what they want you to do is to sign the paperwork so that you're psychologically locked in and you drive off in the car thinking you have a new car. They want you to believe you have a new car. And they may say, hey, congratulations, enjoy your new car or something like that. They may even tell you you've been financed. And then what they're doing in the back room is dealing with the bank, 
trying to get the bank to pay them. And when the bank won't pay them, we don't like this deal. We think the person's a bad credit risk or, you know, we don't want to deal with them at all. Then the, uh, then the dealer is now in a bind because they don't want to accept the money from you on a month to month basis. And that's why this is called a spot delivery. You sign the papers and take the car right then and there. Right. And so they want to get you in the car. They put you in the car. You drive off. They continue working on the deal. And when it falls through, they call you up and say, gee, we're really sorry. We can't do the deal at this rate or this amount of money. But if you come in and give us more money down or agree to a higher interest rate, we can make this happen. By then, you've shown the vehicle to family and friends. And now you've got to figure out how you're going to explain to them that you have bad credit, you couldn't keep the car, it becomes an embarrassing situation. So in a lot of cases, people do whatever they can to keep the car. Or maybe the car that they traded in is in such bad condition, they don't want it back. Well, depending on how long it's been, they may have already sold your trade vehicle. They may have already hauled it to the auction or sold it to a wholesaler or even sold it on their lot to another consumer. That's right. And uh, they can get the vehicle back. It's not real easy, but they can, you know, go back and uh, go down the chain, get the vehicle back and, and, and put the customer back in it. But they don't want to do all that work either. And it may be several weeks or months down the road, frankly, and that car may be in another state. So they're going to be pushing pretty hard to keep you in that car. These types of spot delivery scams were especially popular before all the crazy stuff happened in the finance world and banks kind of locked down a little bit tighter on their loan process. And so I was really surprised at how often today this still happens. Now, obviously, I don't let it happen to my clients, but it tends to happen to people who have credit challenges. Maybe they have a low credit score or no credit built up yet. They have a lower income, so maybe they struggle with their debt to income ratio, or they just don't have a lot of money to begin with, those folks are so much more vulnerable. And I saw that the FTC ran a study back in 2011. They interviewed 2,100 consumers that had auto finance related problems. And they found that over 27% had been victims of a yo-yo scam. So clearly this is still happening in today's day and age, and it's overwhelmingly happening to people who have low income or and or bad credit. They just don't have as many options, and they tend to rely on the dealerships to find financing for them through perhaps their portfolio of secondary lenders. Well, that is an educated approach. People here on the radio or on the TV, bad credit, come in. We don't care. We'll get you financed. And that's all they hear. And so they come in and do what they have to do to get a dependable vehicle so that they can go to work. Let's talk about this yo-yo situation when the dealer pulls the consumer back into the dealership with some sob story about the bank not approving the loan. These people have a signed contract for that loan. They have signed the papers for the car. So... Has the dealer broken the law and or violated that contract somehow? How does that work? Well, you have raised a very interesting question. This is not something that Congress or the legislatures have really paid any attention to. The Truth in Lending Act requires anybody who's extending credit to provide five bits of information to purchasers. And you see these items listed on the retail loan installment contract or on your mortgage if you buy a house. There are all these little boxes, right? Right. The, the, there's, a, there's a box and it says Truth in the Lending Act Disclosures and it talks about your APR and how much you're borrowing, how much is, you're going to pay back, what the total financing is going to be and the total cost to you as far as paying for this vehicle. So that says the law, the Truth in the Lending Act says – You've got to tell people what they're borrowing. Well, what tends to happen in this in these cases is the dealer gets you to sign this document and a week, two weeks later, three weeks later, comes back, says, sign, you know, we can't get you done on this deal, but come in and sign this other paperwork. And they backdate the deal to the original date. And when they do that, 
depending on the length of the loan and some other things, it may change the calculation as far as the interest rate. And the interest rate itself may be higher. The FTC study found that people who were victims of yo-yo transactions ended up paying as much as 5% more in interest. Right. Well, the New Deal is different than what I'm talking about. If I, tell, if I say to you, hey, I'll let you borrow $100 at 10%, well, yeah, 10% for the year, you're going to pay me basically uh, $11 a month. Well, technically $105 and because gonna, you're reducing principal and so you're not paying like as much interest. So it ends up being $105 something like that. total. $112 because it's a dollar a month. Anyway, if you only pay for 11 months, but you're still paying me the $112, now the interest is not 10%, it may be 10.5%. And there is a certain little bit of wiggle room uh, disparity that the, the law will allow. I think it's an eighth of a point. But if the interest rate is more than an eighth of a point, then that's a violation of the Truth in Lending Act. So technically, the deal that you sign has to be complete when you sign it. Now, what dealers do is they have their buyer's order, which is a separate document, and it lays out all the beginning numbers, the initial numbers. And on the back side of that, where all the real important information is, is this little paragraph that will say, one, we have a deal, but if we can't sell this paperwork, and they'll talk about funding, if we can't get you funding, uh, but what they're saying is, if we can't sell this paper, then the deal is void. So in essence, we have a contract, but if we can't get something to happen, then we have the right to void this contract. And take the car back. And take our car back. It's a conditional sales agreement. Right. The other side is we don't have a deal at all, but if we sell this to the bank, then the deal becomes final. Okay. And if it doesn't, then you got to give us our car back and we're supposed to give you your car back. But if by chance we have sold your car, We'll give you the value on the front of this document, which is going to be what? A trade-in value. Um, and as a result, not only do you lose transportation, you get less than the fair market value of your vehicle. At least that's what they're thinking. Not only that, some of them will even put in, hey, if you don't bring the car back, we can have you arrested or we might report this as a stolen vehicle and you will owe us rental fees rental fees. That's total crap. That's right. A lot of people have come to me and said, look, I bought this car. The deal's final. I want my money back. The dilemma is a lot of judges don't sit down and really analyze this. They just, a lot of them don't have the time to sit down and figure all this out. This is what's been said to me by at least one judge. You're sitting here your person can't buy the car. They can't afford the car. And now you want them to get the value of that vehicle for free? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> that just doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. And I agree with them. And I say, no, it doesn't, Judge. But here's the deal. That's my client's car they stole. A lot of judges, they just doesn't feel right. And I get that. It does feel different than traditional grand theft auto. <laughs> now, have you seen a lot of these types of cases recently? I haven't seen a lot of yo-yo cases recently. I don't know if dealers have just gotten more savvy and are able to get people back in without them coming to see me, or they just aren't occurring as often. I hope it's that not as many of these transactions are happening. And in this day and age, with all of the technology that we have, all the automated systems, you know, I don't care if it's 8 o'clock on a Friday night or if it's on a Sunday afternoon when the bank is closed, the banks have enough automated systems that are sophisticated enough to give you an automated approval for the loan that's firm enough for the dealer to be able to actually say, yes, this loan is approved and legitimately lend you the money and be able to do the deal. There's really no excuse for it, except again, when you get into the situations with the folks that have bad credit, no credit, or have a debt to income ratio or low income problems that requires an actual human underwriter to look more closely at the loan and make a decision for the bank of as to whether or not they're willing to take on that risk. 
I, th I think there are a lot of, uh, they, they have uh, gone to a lot of automation and it, it may have uh, cut down, down on things. Um, obviously, the, the further down you go on the credit scale, uh, the harder it is uh, going to be to get financing, even from um, subprime lenders. The, the subprime default rate has been increasing. That's been a concern. Uh, lending institutions, banks may have implemented higher criteria, basically telling dealerships we're not going to finance people below this amount. And to make matters worse, interest rates have increased considerably because auto loans are tied to prime, which the Fed has increased, I think, a dozen or so times in the past year. We were seeing, you know, rates in the twos, you know, or threes, sometimes even, you know, 1.5% just a year, year and a half ago, whereas now even people with perfect credit are seeing new car rates, you know, in the fours and fives, unless they're a member of a credit union. Union. So that means that the subprime rates for people with less than perfect credit are even higher, sometimes into the double digits. And that puts a greater strain on people's finances because it drives up the monthly payment. And that in turn creates a greater level of risk for the lenders. Right, right. If someone thinks they have been a victim of a yo-yo scam and they have been called by the dealer and asked to come back in, what should they do? Well, the dealership will do one of two, I think one of two things. One is we'll say, uh, we couldn't get you financed, so come back. We have a different contract, more money down, higher interest rate, or both. Or they'll say, uh, we can't get you financed, bring the car back. In either case, the safest thing to do is just simply take the vehicle back, okay, and go someplace else. Now, I, uh, you know, part of the problem becomes – when a dealership is trying to sell that loan, they may be shooting that out to 15 different lenders and everybody's pulling your credit. And then, you know, what kind of damage does that do to your credit? Right. They call that shotgunning your credit. And that's not something that the dealers should be doing. They should be pulling your credit once, looking at it themselves. And based on that, knowing which lenders they should go to where they have the best chance of you getting approved and not just shooting it out to anybody and everybody and having them all hit your credit at once. Oh, I agree. And they can say everything they want to say. But when it happens and it hurts your credit, they turn around and just kind of shrug their shoulders. If you are car shopping and you're asking the dealer to find financing for you, before you allow them to pull your credit, be sure to ask them if they are going to pull your credit once and send it to the banks or if each bank is going to pull your credit multiple times. Theoretically, if you have multiple lenders pulling your credit for the same type of loan within a two-week period, that's technically not supposed to hurt your credit because the credit bureaus know that you're shopping around, but I don't trust that. So be sure to ask, and better yet, you know, unless you're really having to rely on secondary financing through the dealership's relationships, always come to the dealership with a pre-approval from your own bank or a credit union or some lender already in place. That gives you the strongest financial position when you're car shopping. Now, one thing that you need to do on maybe even on the due bill or we owe bill, write down on that document that the dealership will only pull the credit one time, five times, however many times you're agreeing to. You need to put this stuff in writing. Anything that you agree to with the salesman needs to be in writing. Otherwise, they're going to say it doesn't exist. And that's the purpose of the WIO document. You will normally see the WIO document used in the case where the dealer is going to, you're going to come back to the dealership and then, then they're going to install roof rails or something else on your car. Or they owe you rubber floor mats that they had to order that you're not getting at the time of delivery. But you can put anything you want on that document. Anything you agree to with the salesperson or the manager, even if it's something like, 
they have agreed to provide you with a loaner vehicle anytime you bring your car in for service, even if that's not their normal policy. Get that in writing because if it's a verbal agreement, no one will remember that it happened and they will not make good on it. And be sure that whatever you agree to is very, very specific on that document. Don't let them write a vague statement on the WIO. Make sure it is very specific to what you agreed to. That's right. If you're looking at it from a legal standpoint, if you're trying to keep the new vehicle that you've just purchased, that's not a strong lawsuit. Even though technically the dealership should be ex- accepting the payments because they entered into a contract with you, the, the courts are really having a hard time enforcing that from a, as I said, from a conceptual standpoint, from a, it just doesn't feel right to the judges. So they have a hard time with it. The really strong case is when you take the vehicle back, even if they say, hey, we got a better deal for you, and you take it back and you say, no, I want, I don't want to do a deal with you guys. I'm going to go someplace else. Give me my money back, my trade-in, and my down payment. And they go, oh, no, we can't do that, or we're not going to do that. That becomes a great case because now, <laughs> now the reverse is happening. They're keeping something that they don't have a right to. When I bring a lawsuit, I'm basically alleging the civil form of stealing. Right. They essentially stole your down payment. They stole your money or they stole your trade. Well, technically, it is the unauthorized possession and control of somebody's property to the exclusion of the owner's rights. That sounds like stealing to me. (laughs) Absolutely. You've been protecting consumers from fraud for so many years now. How many of these yo-yo type cases have you dealt with in kind of in general? What's been the result? Well, I remember I've had, I had one young lady come in and she had tried to buy a car and the dealership didn't go through with the deal, took the car and we had wound up having to try that case and the jury awarded her basically a small amount of money. From that, we learned a lot about how this kind of transaction worked. And so the next case that came up, gentleman came in to me. He had gone to a dealership and uh, he had a Ford Wrangler. A Jeep Wrangler. Uh, excuse me, a Jeep Wrangler. So, sorry about that. And so he was, he was trying just to get a lower payment. Didn't need to trade the vehicle in, didn't particularly want to trade it in, liked the vehicle, but needed, just wanted to try to get a lower payment. And so he was dealing with a salesman that he knew, and the salesman said, here, sign this paperwork. And he looks at it, and, you know, the payment's going from 480 down to 464 or something like that. Uh, and the salesman basically said, don't worry about it, sign it, and we'll keep working on it to try to lower the payment. Yeah, that wasn't even worth his time to go into the dealership to, re- to reduce a monthly payment by that little. My guy signs the paperwork. Drives off in a geo. A geo. Oh my gosh. So not only did he get a bad loan deal, but he literally drove off the lot in one of the only vehicles that is worse and less reliable than a Wrangler. Right. So he so he drives off and they call him up and they say, um, you know, your credit's not all that great. And he said and they said, you know, we can't get you financed. Why don't you have your girlfriend come in and co-sign on the deal? And he says, no, no, we've broken up. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Never have someone that you are not legally married to or blood related to co-sign on your loan, like ever. Bad idea. So he goes on and they're trying to get him back in to sign other paperwork. And he says, no, I'm not going to sign any more paperwork. And the next thing he knows, it's about three months down the road, and uh, the bank is calling saying, hey, you're late on your payment. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I don't have a loan with you guys. Now, keep in mind, he's been getting the adverse action letters saying he's been turned down for credit. So the bank decides to repossess this vehicle, comes out, takes it. So now my guy's walking. It's about three months later. I told him to go ahead and, and ask the bank. Uh, you know, he's talking to the bank and the bank says, well, we have a signed contract. The two of you, you know, signed by everybody. And then we're like, what do you mean everybody? And send us a copy. And when they did, 
it was real interesting to see the girlfriend's signature on this paperwork. And uh, my client calls up the ex-girlfriend and says, did you sign this? And she goes, absolutely not. So basically now we're dealing with a forged retail installment sales contract to get this guy in a car that he doesn't want. Oh, wow. So this is more than just violating the Truth in Lending Act or violating the contract. This crosses the line into actual fraud. So my guy's walking for about six months until he can afford to buy his boss's $1,000 van. Uh, We're getting ready for trial, and the dealership says, well, we'll give you $2,500 to go away. Leave us alone. We're sitting in that big deal. And my client, of course, says, no, we're not going to do that, and we'll try the case. Well, the jury didn't like it, especially the forgery stuff. And the jury came back and awarded my client what amounted to about $75,000. And then the court tacked on attorney's fees on top of that. But that's, that is... That is the better case when they take your vehicle versus you trying to keep the vehicle uh, and fighting over the new vehicle. You're trying to get your pay, your money back, trade in and, and cash. That's a much better case. And I will bring this up because this was real important in this case. One of the things was the dealership was saying, you don't have any damages. I was like, what are you talking about? He was walking for how long? That sounds like damages to me. Well, the the argument was we did your client a favor. He owed thirteen thousand five hundred dollars on this vehicle that was only worth thirteen thousand. So we've paid that off. We've given your guy a benefit. Ooh, whopping five hundred dollars. Right. Well, the court the court turned around and said, No, we don't value cars based on how much equity you have in the car. We value cars based on what they're worth, and that's the damage. He lost a $13,000 asset, and that's what you have to pay. And then there were punitive damages on top of that. Well, good. And hopefully that case, the publicity around it within the automotive industry, hopefully that will discourage other dealerships from pulling that crap on someone. Unfortunately, as a consumer, it is still your responsibility to watch out for your own butt. And the best way to do that is to always know your credit. Never make a major purchase of any kind, but especially an automobile, without knowing your credit situation. And you can go to annualcreditreport.com. That is the government website that they set up that allows people to pull their own credit and be able to see their credit across all three credit bureaus. It's a soft pull, so it doesn't hurt your score. And you have to pay a little bit of money. I think you have to pay like 10, 12 bucks or whatever to get the actual scores, but you can see everything that's on your credit. And that way, you know what your situation is and you can shop your loan around before you go to the dealership so that you're not relying on them to find a loan for you. Even if you're in the secondary financing or subprime lending category, there's a lot of secondary lenders that have websites where you can get a pre-approval directly through them online. And once you have a pre-approval, you can always go to the dealership and say, hey, I am pre-approved for this amount at this rate. If you can beat that rate, wonderful. I'll give you a shot at the financing. If not, no big deal. I'll just go with these guys and I've already got my loan locked in place. And never sign the paperwork and certainly never drive off the lot with the new car unless you know that the loan is final. Now, Steve, what kind of paperwork do you need to know and have confidence that that loan truly is finalized and will be funded? Because clearly signing the truth and lending sheet in the installment loan contract doesn't mean squat. Well, one of the things is have somebody write it down. You're going to be sitting across the table from the finance manager, and he should be able to tell you right then, Are you, am I financed? Technically, the, the dealer is the one financing the deal. They're the ones extending the credit. And when they sign the contract, in theory, the deal is done. But it's that fine print somewhere in all that documentation that allows them to get out of that deal if they can't sell that paper. So what you want to do is 
have them have the finance manager write down on a piece of paper. You are financed. You're not financed. The deal is funded. The deal is not funded so that you know what to do. And if it's not done, leave the car. Yeah, don't formally take delivery of that car until you know for certain that that loan has been finalized and will be funded. Furthermore, be sure to ask them, which bank is this loan through? And when is my monthly payment due? When should I expect to get the little booklet in the mail that tells me how to make my payment? Get all of that information up front so that you're not at risk of if the bank takes too long to get that documentation to you, you at least know which bank to call to ask, hey, where's my stuff? When is my payment? Do I need to make this payment? Because you don't want your first payment on this new car to be late. Right, right. So if someone feels like they may have been a victim of one of these yo-yo scams and they aren't really sure what their rights are and what they should do, how can they get a hold of you to maybe speak with you and either engage your services or maybe get some advice from you? Well, I'm only licensed in South Carolina. I can get uh, what amounts to a temporary license in another state to handle a particular case. But generally, my cases are in South Carolina. I'm in Charleston. Um, I handle cases all across the state. Uh, My telephone number is 843-763-5297. And what's your website, Steve? That is www.moscuslawfirm.com. That's M-O-S-K-O-S lawfirm.com. If you're located in a state where Steve doesn't practice and you feel you've been a victim of a yo-yo scam or any other type of consumer fraud, you can reach out to your state's attorney general's office and also reach out to a consumer fraud attorney that is licensed in your state. You can find them on the web. Well, Steve, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Folks, I hope you never find yourself on the end of one of these yo-yo transactions. And that's such a great term to describe how this works with them pulling you back into the dealership. If you do find yourself in one of these situations, again, Contact your state attorney general's office. Contact Steve if you're in the Carolinas or another consumer fraud attorney in your state. And if you ever have just any car buying questions in general, feel free to reach out to me at thecarchick.com. I'm always happy to help. Until next time, folks, drive safely. We're out of here. The Straight Shift Podcast is copyright Leanne Shattuck, The Car Chick, 2017. All views expressed by guest and or co-hosts are those of the guest and or co-hosts, and not necessarily those of Leanne Shattuck or The Car Chick.